It's the Fitness Lab Pittsburgh podcast, a new episode every week. A podcast about movement, part of making your life complete. Fitness Lab Pittsburgh, a.k.a. Fit Lab PGH, brings you interviews with people in the Pittsburgh area who understand movement is part of what makes life complete. Looking for a new movement idea or just want to hear interesting stories about people who make movement a priority? This is the podcast for you. Whether you consider the gym, dojo, or fitness studio your third place, or just want to learn more about movement activity and fitness to enhance your life, give FitLab PGH a listen. We interview locals in the Pittsburgh area who make Pittsburgh a great place to move. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play, or check out our website for other subscription options. Subscribing is free and gives you notifications when we release new episodes. Each podcast episode will be long enough to pique your interest and short enough to hold your attention. Have an idea for an episode? Know somebody we should interview? Or just want to connect with us? Drop us an email, fitlabpgh at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter or Instagram at fitlabpgh. Already a fan of FitLab PGH? Check out our sister podcast, Moving to Live. Moving to Live is a podcast for movement professionals and amateur aficionados. Moving to Live offers weekly interviews with movement professionals featuring topics from career development to coaching tips and education resources to advice for parents of student athletes. We look forward to hearing from you and we hope you enjoy our next interview starting now. FitLab PGH and Moving to Live are both podcasts that believe movement should be treated as a lifestyle, not just an activity. Today, we've got a crossover episode, which is when we take an interview and release it on both Moving to Live and FitLab Pittsburgh, because we think the topic is of interest to both of our listeners, and we think the information is something that's worth passing along. For those of you who are lifestyle movers and understand the importance of movement and having friends... Our four-legged friends are just as important, if not more important in some instances, than our two-legged friends. That's why I jumped at the opportunity to talk to Dr. Julie Compton, veterinary surgeon, about the potential uses of CBD. I think you'll be surprised if you come back in two or three years from now and re-listen to this podcast about how our knowledge has changed, but I think right now, being aware of CBD and how it's starting to be used with pets is something that's useful. Dr. Compton, thanks for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and time. FitLab PGH and Moving to Live are back with another podcast episode, as you heard at the beginning with the intro. Sometimes we do a cross-podcast where we have a topic that, that interests listeners for both Moving to Live and FitLab Pittsburgh. Remember, the key ethos for both of them is movement is part of what makes your life complete. This is a bit of an atypical one today, but I'm excited about it because... If you follow me on social media, if you follow FitLab PGH and Moving to Live on social media, you always see pictures of my Labradors. One of them has inflammatory bowel disease and also idiopathic epilepsy. And the vets that she works with do a phenomenal job, but it's kind of uh, trying to plug holes in the dike with a dog that has that many medical problems. And my goal is to give her the highest quality of life. A few weeks back when she was up in internal medicine getting some tests, one of the Tex was all excited when she saw that I had started her on CBD products, not marijuana, but CBD products. And she said, there's a vet here who gives lectures on this, who's a surgeon who uses it. So I asked her to give the vet my card and believe it or not, the vet actually responded to me, which I always appreciate because sometimes when you give somebody a card, you're wondering what they're going to do with it or if they're going to think this is a crazy person. And I am fortunate enough to be able to sit down today with Dr. Julie Compton, who is a surgeon, who is going to tell us a little bit about CBD and her experience with it. I think the great thing that Dr. Compton said is the fact that when I first talked to her, she said, look, I'm not an expert on this, but I've done some research and I can give you some information. So Dr. Compton, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to FitLab PGH in Moving to Live about CBD in dogs and your experiences with it. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the time. I know that uh, all of us who are pet owners are very familiar with vets and some of us more familiar than others based on our experiences. But for people who are listening who maybe don't understand what a vet is, if they don't have pets, what's the education that is required to, get a, to become a uh, veterinary medical doctor? Right. So 
Um, most people that go to veterinary school usually go to undergraduate first, anywhere from two to four years. Most everybody is four years. Then you go to veterinary school if you're lucky to get in, because um, there's not that many schools in the United States compared to medical schools. Um, and at that point, if you pass your veterinary boards, you are now a veterinarian. Um, but then there's a subset of people that like to go on and maybe be more um, specialized, more specific. So they have subboarding in, say, like for me, I'm a surgeon. So I went an additional six years to be a surgeon. So two internships and a four-year residency after that. Um, but there's everything. There's dentists, ophthalmologists, cardiologists, internists. Um, you name the specialty and, and they have it. I think the secret that many people don't realize is it's probably harder to get into veterinary school than it is to get into medical school, partially because, as you said, there are fewer vet schools than there are, or there aren't that many vet schools. That's 100% correct. And I mean, the pool of students that are coming out and want to be veterinarians, they all have 4.0 averages. So how do you separate one kid from another? Why does one get into vet school and the other one doesn't? It's a tough crowd. And I know I've had dogs and cats for probably 25 years and about 15 years ago, was the first time I realized or learned that there were specialists because my first Labrador, who unfortunately has since had to be put down at 12 and a half, but when she was seven, she tore her ACL or cranial cruciate ligament. And my regular vet said, well, something's wrong with her leg. We need to get her to a specialist. And at your facility, I met Dr. Anderson and his comment was, oh, she tore her cranial cruciate ligament. And I said, what's that? He said, ACL. And I said, uh-oh. He says, oh, we can fix that. I do three or four a week. Yeah, right. So there are, that's when I learned there are specialists and with my current, one of my current dogs, I've learned it. So with a surgeon, what type of surgeries do you do? Are there uh, specialty vet surgeons who just do orthopedics or just do internal organs or is it the whole spectrum? As a veterinary surgeon, you really have to do everything to pass your surgery boards. So you do everything from neurosurgery to orthopedic surgery, um, cardiothoracic, uh, urogenital, you, you have to cover the whole gamut. But now at our practice, we have eight, going to be nine surgeons. Um, we are very fortunate because we can start subspecializing. Um, so I probably do 50-50 um, of soft tissue surgery and orthopedic surgery. But, you know, we have another surgeon that he prefers bones. All he wants to do is fix bones and do orth orthopedic work, which is fine because then I'll take all of his soft tissue work and, it, and everybody's happy. And is there something, if somebody wants to specialize in something as a vet, can you do an additional residency just, for example, in orthopedics or just in soft tissue? They do have that. So after, if you feel like spending your entire life in school, um, after you um, get boarded and then you're boarded in your specialty, um, they do have fellowships. So they have surgical oncology. You can get do fellowships in that. Um, yeah, there's a lot you can get into. And the real reason I wanted to interview you is I wanted to talk to you about your experiences as a vet and as a pet owner using CBD. This is something for people who are listening. There's a lot of misinformation on the Internet. There's a lot of information. If you get on the googly web, you can find everything to this is horrible stuff that will destroy your pet to this is a miracle thing. I took my pet off every other drug. Actually, CBD is not a drug, but I took my pet off every drug and just use this. Right. And it's the same thing with humans. So I guess the first question to ask people is, what is CBD? So CBD um, comes from uh, plants. So it's a phytocannabinoid. So it's an extract from the plant where, um, the, like the, you heard about, obviously everybody knows about marijuana. Um, so there are two kind of strains. There's your hemp plant and your marijuana plant, and they're all considered cannabis. So the strain that we're looking at, you can actually grow a plant to kind of weed out or breed down the amount of THC so that you can maximize the amount of CBD so that you don't have a lot of the psychoactive effects that the THC has and you can just get all the, reap the benefits of the rest of the plant or the CBD. And I think for people who are listening, if you're quite old, you may remember way, way back before the 1930s, hemp was actually widely grown in the United States for rope. Rope. They used it on ships for for rope. They've had. Um, I think. I believe the Constitution was written on hemp paper. Uh, so it's everywhere. They. It wasn't. I think it became uh, kind of more uh, illegal. I don't know if it was in the 1950s, 40s, or 50s. I don't. Ha I can't remember right off. But, um, you know, we've taken it out of our, our culture, and I think that not only have we taken it out of the culture wrongfully, because taking out CBD, I think people are thinking about THC. 
Um, and they're grouping those two things together, and they shouldn't be grouped together. Um, CBD, until recently, has been scheduled one narcotic, so grouped with morphine and all the other high, high-end narcotics that are very addictive. CBD doesn't belong in that group, and I believe it was December of 2018 that the government wisely just took it off of the Schedule One uh, group. And I know I personally use CBD for myself for some chronic uh, degenerative disc disease, etc., and when I look at the certificate of authenticity where they have it tested, it says less than 0.3% THC, which I believe to be sold as THC, um, non-psychoactive, it has to have that. It has to be less than 0.3%. Um, and some of the products are approaching the 0.3%. Um, the product that I use is 0.07% THC, so it's basically non-existent. But again, it's not an FDA-regulated uh, supplement, because that's truly what it is. You can't say it's a drug, it's a supplement. So it's really nice, like you said, yours um, has a third-party testing. You really want a product that has third-party testing because that's, in my mind right now, the best that we can do so that you know what you're taking. What's actually in that bottle is what you're taking. And I know from talking to Don Moxley, who talked to me for moving to live in FitLab Pittsburgh, the other concern you have is if it's grown in some places, it may be high in heavy metals. So by having the certificate of authenticity, you can be assured that you're not ingesting heavy metals or in your case, in my case also with our pets, that our pets are not ingesting heavy metals. It, well, exactly. So if you have that third party testing, most of them you can scan the bottle. What do they call that? The Q, the Q barcode scanner thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like a square. Square with all the little squiggly lines. Looks like a maze. So if you have that on there, I mean, you have a phone app, you can look and see what every single batch, what, what's in every single one of them. Because from what I understand, um, what I've heard is that, you know, a lot of the sourcing out through China, you can get a lot of CBD products for super cheap. You can get a gallon of CBD, spend 50 bucks, and you think you hit a gold mine. But what you don't know is you don't know what exactly is in it. Where did they grow that from? Because hemp is really good at leaching out the soil. So you can, like, say here in the United States, if you want to start a hemp farm, your first year or two, of product that's coming out you have to get rid of because it's pulling all the pesticides and all the crap out of the out of the ground so i think that what's happening is i understand that it's being planted along the rivers out in china and then they're taking the cbd from that and then instead of keeping it for themselves they sell it to us suckers here in the united states and then we buy it for cheap and i think we're doing a good job and I think my other understanding from what I've read, and you can probably correct me or confirm with this, is when you're buying CBD for pets, you definitely do not want to have high THC levels because the THC with these psychoactive products can be bad for pets. It can. Um, I, but I don't. I think we should be a little bit careful of saying that. I, I bet there will be uses of THC in our pets. I think it's just out there a little bit right now. Um, so for now, to be a little bit on the safer and conservative side, I think you really have to stick with the hemp plant and be less than the 0.3%. Because we are seeing pets come into the emergency service that have gotten into something that they shouldn't mom have. Mom and dad's product. Mom and, mom and dad's <laughs> real product. Um, and they're coming in and they're having seizures and they're comatose and they're urina urinating on themselves and they're, they're, act they're dying. So, But I do think that there could be a place for THC in pet medicine, but for now, until more research is done, CBD, I know, doesn't cause any ill effects that I've seen so far in my patients. And I know I think that's an interesting thing to kind of go down that rabbit hole. There is not a whole lot of evidence or research actually out there on CBD for humans or for pets. And I was very interested to learn that there was a physician in the Pittsburgh area who was using it with her patients and also using it with her own personal dog. One of the things that people wonder about is, well, what do you use CBD for? I know when I talk to people for humans, they mention, as you say, it's a supplement and you might want to look at it as a nutraceutical or something that a human should take on a regular basis to allow you to maintain normal levels of an, of uh, your endogenous cannabinoids. What is it for pets? What what are, what are the uses, or what is your experience with using it with your patients? And then also, I want to get more into detail about you using it with your own personal dog. All right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, with the animal side of things, um, I'm I'm a surgeon. Surgeons like to fix things. We've sun sometimes been called just monkeys. We just fix things and it moves on and not have the ability to think. So that's fine. Um, but what I've seen use for it for is not everything has to be fixed. 
if we can just improve things for our, our pets. So in my mind, if surgery is going to improve that pet, then yeah, let's do that. But if surgery may or may not, then can we find something else to improve their life? So in my world, what I use it a lot for is treatment for inflammation or pain. And that could be associated with osteoarthritis. That could be associated with maybe we just did a surgery. So it can help alleviate some of the symptoms of pain. But the other thing is, too, whenever I'm doing surgery, those patients then have to be strictly cage confined. And then they have to wear that big halo, the e-collar. And there's not one pet on the face of this earth that likes those things. So anxiety is another good use for CBD is what they use it for in people. And I find there's a lot of relief for dogs, especially when I'm trying to get them to stay strictly cage confined for two months, say when your dog had his knee surgery with Dr. Anderson. So to me, those are some of the big things. Currently, I've also been using it on some of my cancer patients. There's a little bit of research out there. I think it was in mice that um, they had two sets of mi- two sets of mice. They were given human cancer, and then they one was given CBD and the other one was not. Um, the cancer still grew in both subsets of mice, but it grew at a much slower rate in the ones that received the CBD. I don't know what that means. I don't have any research further on that, but there's something to it. It just means that we have our first step and let's make the next step and the next step because could it be a supplement for our cancer patients? I'm curious, how did you first become aware of CBD in pets? Because I know as physicians, uh, even veterinary physicians, uh, you want to fix things, as you said, Mm -hmm. and sometimes if you use the googly web and you start reading things like, yeah, this is too good to be true, because I know if you uh, pull up the prescription for a a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, it gives you all the benefits, but it also gives you the side effects, and similar with any other drug, there's always a positive and a negative for anything that you're putting in your body, especially when it's a, a pharmaceutical. So how did you first become aware of CBD? So it was probably August 2018, and my own personal pet, her name's Kira. Uh, She's a German Shepherd, probably the most beautiful Shepherd on the face of the earth. Um, She's 11, and she struggles with severe hip dysplasia. She has arthritis in one of her elbows. Um, Most German Shepherds, as they get older, get a little bit neurologic in their back end. Um, And she was a blood donor at my hospital, and every two months we would check her blood before she would don't before she would donate to make sure everything was clear and clean. And she'd been doing it for years and everything's been fine. She's been taking her non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and all of her other drugs that she needed. Well, one time her ALT, which is a liver enzyme, was through the roof. It was over 900. And I know two months before it was not. So I immediately freaked out, as you would do as a pet owner, not acting as a veterinarian at that point, but took her straight off of the anti-inflammatory and rechecked her blood work nine days later and it was back to normal. But that just was my clue that this child can no longer be on a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. What else can I do? I ran the gamut of everything. I ran the gamut of underwater treadmill physical therapy, acupuncture, laser, uh, Adequan injections, gabapentin, you name it. Um, So I was in a food store, pet food store, picking up the food for the dogs, and I found a bottle of CBD behind the counter. I asked to look at it. I don't know what the heck I was looking at. Um, so I'm reading it and it was, I think it was like, she was supposed to get two dropper fulls twice a day. And I think it was like 125 bucks. And I'm thinking, well, this might last two to three weeks. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just gave it back to the lady. It seemed like a lot of money when I don't know why it would work or how it would work. Um, and then I remembered I had a friend of mine. Um, she's a veterinary neurosurgeon, Julie Jarbo. And I knew that she was using CBD a lot in her pets, so I gave her a call. And uh, so that's that's how that all started. I bought a bottle for my dog and then also for me. Uh, I was having back pain, so the two of us started taking it together, which initially was a little awkward because I I didn't know how to um, put the dropper in her mouth, but then also in my mouth. And as much as I love her, I don't need her spit in my mouth. So... (laughs) So my friend Jolie said, well, put it on your finger for your dog and rub it on her gums because it works best that way. And then for the humans, it goes under your tongue and you sit for 30 seconds and then swallow what's left. Um, So for Kira, um, she was to the point, she's pretty debilitated. She was no longer able to come upstairs for bedtime. All of our dogs come upstairs, cats come upstairs, even if we didn't want them, they come upstairs. (laughs) Um, So she was no longer able to join the family. So I started giving her CBD. 
and she scared the heck out of me. About two and a half weeks later, I was upstairs doing something, turned around, and she was right behind me, and it just it frightened me because I, I didn't expect anybody up there. Um, and I, the only thing that changed was she was on CBD. So I'm not telling you that she doesn't limp. I'm not telling you that she's not sore. But if my child can make it up the stairs, because, again, our pets are our children for the most part, but if she can make it up the stairs and sleep with us at night, that to me is quality of life. That, that just improved her quality of life and my quality of life, my whole family's quality of life from one little thing. And I know people are going to be listening to this, and one of the questions that will come up is, what, if any, are there side effects of CBD? Are there dogs that, you're, that you see in surgery that you're saying, okay, this dog probably is not a good candidate for me to talk to the owners about potentially supplementing with CBD in addition to what we're doing with drugs and surgery? I don't have too many reservations yet. I know um, the product that I like to use, they do say be careful if the uh, patients have low blood pressure because it can lower their blood pressure by a few points. Um, other than that, if it causes a dog to have diarrhea and they already have diarrhea symptoms, then maybe you shouldn't use it. But for the most part, I've not seen anything toxic. I've not seen drawbacks. Um, I did talk to Dr. Uh, Bagley. He's one of our ophthalmologists. And he said that it might be very useful in glaucoma patients. With that said, you know, when you said that there's always some good and there's always some bad, there was also a recent study that came out that said that the CBD may actually increase ocular pressure. So, again, we need to, I think, look into that a little bit further. And do you think, or from your research, do you think that the reason we haven't seen a whole lot of research on this is because until recently, it was a Schedule One drug, and that is right. although there is research done on Schedule One drugs, for anybody who does research to get permission from either the animal IRB or the human IRB is generally quite difficult. Yes, your hands are much more tied. It's very hard to get the medication to even medication supplement, whatever you want to call it here, in order to test it. So I think the gates have opened, um, and I think we're going to see a lot more in the next probably two to five years. A lot of research, it's kind of like exciting. I'm curious, when you first uh, became aware of this and started looking at it for your dog, how long was it before you connected the dots and said, you know, this might be beneficial for some of my patients also? Well, and that was just it. I know that my friend was using it in all of her neuro patients, and I, won't, you, I felt really uneasy about using it in any of my patients or recommending it uh, until I could see, like, does it actually work? Because I'm pretty pessimistic on medications. Again, surgeons like to fix things. We don't give medications to fix things or supplements. So um, after about two and a half weeks when I saw her come upstairs, I thought there is something to this. And after I took it and I could feel an 80% improvement in my back pain, I mean, there's nothing more than like trying it yourself and seeing that it has helped you. So at that point, I started considering it in a non-obtrusive way to my clients. If I, If you just listen to your clients, hear what they are saying and hear what they want. Like I had a 12 year old Yorkie, uh, blew its ACL out, go figure. That's what we see a lot of. But the dog's 12 years old. Um, the dog is not out running marathons. It's not expected to go on five mile hikes with the owner. It's expected to be on the couch, go to the mailbox with mom and dad and come back in and eat. That's all it's expected to do. So, you know, putting $4,000 into that dog's surgery, putting the dog through that surgery, um, with the risks of anesthesia, the risks of um, infection, everything associated with surgery, the owners really weren't, you know, I could have pushed surgery on them and probably she would have done it, but it wasn't the right thing. You could, if you just listen to the mom, it wasn't what she wanted. Um, so she asked if there was any medications that would help. So of course, you know, we talk about the NSAIDs and the problem with the NSAIDs but one, the good thing is, like you said, there's always good and bad. The good thing is they work great, um, make the dogs feel great. The negative thing is it can cause body functions to not work correctly. So you can get GI ulcers. You can have your liver and kidneys suffer from it. So we make them come in every two months and get a blood draw. So now the mom is calculating in her mind, well, I'm really busy. I've got four kids. I don't want to come into the vet clinic every two months and spend $100 on blood work. Never mind the exam because there's always an exam too. Um, so she wanted other things. So I talked to her about using CBD, um, as well as like considering gabapentin, um, but I talked to her about CBD, um, gave her my phone number. She got a bottle and it was two and a half 
three, probably three weeks later, um, she called and said, I need another bottle. Can you mail it to me? She's like, he's almost not limping anymore. You know, we're, there's not yelping out in pain. Um, and if this is how it's going to be for the next two to three years of his life, she's like, I would never get surgery. So I know that sounds awkward. A surgeon just kind of pushed, <laughs> pushed a surgery away. But to me, like that makes me sleep at night. It, it was the right thing for that pet. And I'm curious, have you ever had, uh, pet owners who look at you when you say this and say, no, no, that's drug, that's uh, illegal or that's something. I don't want to put my dog on something like that. Most of the time, no. And uh, honestly, most of the time they're asking me about it, which is also one of the reasons that I got into it because clients would ask me, well, I'm, I'm going to give my dog some of my CBD oil. Is that going to be okay? And I was like, well, sure. Can't hurt. Go ahead and try. But I really had no idea what I was saying. I had, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about CBD, nothing about endocannabinoids. I knew nothing. So that's where I kind of started at least reading and learning a little bit about it because you do not learn about this in veterinary school. They don't, they don't offer it. you got to do it on your own. And you mentioned that. You met, you've mentioned this a couple times, endocannabinoids. Can you, for people who maybe are not familiar at all, just briefly explain what that is in very simple terms? Yeah, because that's all I have is simple terms. <laughs> but endocannabinoids is... Um, it, they are substances that are made in your body that helps regulate homeostasis. Homeostasis is just your body's ability to maintain regu regular normalcy. Um, and if you're deficient in any of those substances, then maybe you have increased anxiety. Maybe you're unable to sleep. Maybe you have more inflammation than you should have in your back, for example. Um, so when you take CBD, it's just replenishing what you're deficient in. So you can't really overdose on CBD. It's just going to pass out of your system. It's only going to fill what you're missing. And I think I know I've been dropping down the rabbit hole with this just because I'm innately curious. And I believe it was first isolated or discovered in the early 1980s in Israel. I might have to correct you on that. You can't. I, I believe it was back in the 1940s that it was discovered, but I don't think they knew what they discovered. <laughs> And they isolated it separate from uh, marijuana. So I think it was much before that. But we're just, I think, all the education on it and learning um, the endocannabinoid part of it, I, I would agree with you, is probably more the 80s. And I'm curious, when you look at the research for this for CBD, I mean, there's, I know there's a number of small studies out there that have looked at it with epilepsy in humans. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned one or two studies with animals. There really has not been a whole lot of research done at all. So it's kind of, we don't know what the benefits are. We just know that there doesn't seem to be, for most animals, very many side effects that are negative. Is that correct? That, that's exactly what I'm seeing. Um, you can do a pub, PubMed search and you will find thousands of articles. But what we want it for as people, for our dogs or for us, is we want it to treat a specific condition. So that's where the research is going to have to get much more specific. Um, but I would argue, I know that we talked about this before, I would argue, why are we reaching for it to treat a condition? Why are we not reaching for it as our daily supplement to keep our endocannabinoids at a steady state? Use it for homeostasis. Why are we waiting till our body is in a state of disarray to, to take it? So... I, to me and my family, that's what we, we take it twice a day. It is our normal, sits right next to the coffee pot. <laughs> Mine is before my espresso. And okay. I know I think this is something that people need to think about. It may not be for you right now. It may not be for your pets. But I suspect what we know now is going to be significantly less than what we know in five years. And we'll probably find out that there are certain medical conditions for both humans and for pets that it works for and other medical conditions that it doesn't. I think it's something that people should be aware of because, as you said, with your particular dog, without this, there's a good chance she would no longer be here. And you've had at least six months, if not longer, with her that you wouldn't have had. We've been talking with Dr. Julie Compton. She is a veterinary surgeon who's talked about her experiences using CBD oil with her own dog and how she talks to her patients, owners about it. Not saying you should use it, but just saying this is something to think about. This is something to be aware about. Dr. Compton, I want to thank you for taking time to talk to Moving to Live in Fit Lab Pittsburgh about something that for those of us who make our dogs part of our family and part of our movement, they really are part of our lifestyle. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Fit Lab PGH, brought to you by Moving to Live. 
Intro and exit music is Marathon Man by Jason Shaw. Check out the show notes for contact info for our latest guests, links to other information mentioned in the episode, and links to our sister podcast, Moving to Live. Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise for professionals and amateur aficionados. Moving to Live offers topics from career development to coaching tips and education resources to advice for parents of student-athletes. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play, or check out our website for other subscription options. Your free subscription gets you notified when we release a new episode. Questions, comments, suggestions? Email us at fitlabpgh at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter and Instagram at fitlabpgh and like us on Facebook. If you enjoy our podcasts, please tell your friends about us and consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. Make FitLab PGH a go-to place to learn more about movement in the Pittsburgh area. Until next time, keep on moving.